Thank you. Uh, thanks, everybody, for uh, coming to my uh, webinar today on uh, factor models. Um, let me see if, uh, yes. So let's, uh, you know, define what factor models are. Uh, factors or their counterpart factor loadings is really two sides of the same coin. Uh, it is really just any variable that can be used to uh, predict returns. Uh, for example, if you're uh, looking at a fundamental factor, then uh, any line item in a financial statement of a company can be a factor. Or if you're a technical uh, trader, then any technical indicators can be a factor. Or you might call it factor loading. Um, you know, the difference between factor and factor loading is just that uh, one might be an observable quantity, the other one might be a regression coefficient of the returns relative to that observable quantity. So uh, examples of uh, these uh, factors or factor loadings would be uh, uh, book-to-market ratio, return on earnings, dividend yield, and so on and so forth, or even simple uh, returns can be considered as a, uh, as a factor loading or a factor. Similarly, now these uh, factors that I've described so far, or these factor loadings that I've described so far, uh, consider what they call cross-sectional factors because they cross-sectional because their value depends on each stock. Obviously, uh, Apple's uh, dividend yield is different from Microsoft, so you know each of these factors are different at the same at the moment of time. They are different for each stock, but there are also factors that are macroeconomic variables, things such as the return of uh, gold. GDP growth or the return of a um, uh, uh, you know, XML portfolio. What XML portfolio means is that it's the difference in returns between a portfolio of high book to market value stocks and low book to market value stocks. So in, in, in other words, uh, the, the spread between value and growth stocks. Uh, SMB return is the difference between small cap stocks and uh, and the big cap stocks, and there is actually another uh, another of these uh, macroeconomic uh, factor that is called the um, the winners minus losers. That's a momentum factor. You know how what's the difference in returns of a uh, stock that has gone up recently versus stock that had gone down recently. Now all these uh, numbers are called um, time series factors because they actually don't depend, don't vary across uh, across different stocks, right? Uh, you know, gold return is gold return. It doesn't matter whether, you know, the gold return, uh, you know, you're looking at it uh, to try to predict the uh, uh, next day return of uh, IBM versus uh, some uh, Newmont mining. Uh, Similarly, XML return is the return of a fixed portfolio of growth minus value stocks. It doesn't matter whether you are using it to predict a value stock or growth stock. So these are called time series uh, factors, and they do change in value every day, of course, uh, but they do not uh, depend on each individual stock's value. So it's oftentimes, uh, because of that property, they are often called, um, the, these would be called factors, uh, and uh, they Corresponding factor loadings, which is the regression coefficient uh, of these of, of a return uh, versus these times this factor, those will, those regression coefficient will be called a factor loading, uh, because the, in this case the factor loading does depend on each stock because the the sensitivity of a stock's return relative to these times of this factor, relative to gold, relative to GDP growth, obviously depends on which stock you're talking about. Uh, you know, certain, uh, let's say, um, uh, bank stocks, for example, uh, would probably, uh, you know, have a uh, negative loading to interest rate increase, right? Uh, whereas, uh, you know, technology stock may be less sensitive to interest rate increase, therefore uh, their factor loadings does depend on each stock. Now, uh, before I go on, I uh, certainly welcome any questions. Uh, if you have um, any questions, please go, uh, feel free to type it in the window um, and I will try to answer them. Uh, you know, I, I certainly don't uh, want you to need to leave it, leave the questions until the end. So it's better to really clear up any mis, mis uh, uh, confusion uh, as I uh, go on. 
Okay. Um, so now, what's the so interesting about uh, you know factors? Why are people studying factor models? What you know? What 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 is the place of a factor model in a trader's or investor's arsenal? The reason factor models are interesting is because you know, immediately you will see that uh, to earn returns based on these factors, it immediately implies risk. This is by no means riskless arbitrage, right? Traders oftentimes are looking for uh, arbitrage opportunities, which are hopefully riskless, or at least the risk is uh, diversifiable. You know, if you trade enough strategy or enough stocks, the risk will you know, average out to zero. But factor model doesn't work that way. They, you know, no matter how many uh, stocks you put in your portfolio that uh, you that uh, that you try to trade using a factor model, there will be the risk that is cannot be diversified away. For example, uh, many people know uh, that over the long term, value stocks outperform growth stocks. After all, that's how Warren Buffett uh, become rich, right? You know, you buy value stock and uh, you short growth stock. However, this Strategy, you know, might you might call it the HML strategy because it uses the HML factor. Uh, this strategy, is, uh, though it has a, a reasonable long-term return, has severe drawdowns, particularly uh, during the financial uh, crisis or the aftermath of a financial crisis. Um, and actually, it also did very poorly uh, during the. Uh, 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 Financial bubble. You know, if you remember the dot com bubble, that uh, in the late 1990s, just before the the bubble burst in early 2000, the value stock nobody wants them. They just, you know, nobody interested in these boring stocks, and everybody are chasing the high yield. Uh, I mean, the high growth, uh, uh, you know, stock that has no no uh, revenue or even you no know, no earnings and not in, maybe maybe not even. Uh, have ad revenue, so in those situations you will have a severe drawdown if you are trading this HML factor uh, model, and so the long-term return of uh, a factor model is a compensation for this risk. These risks are never going to go away. You no matter how many value stock or how many growth stock you add to a HML portfolio, but there is a silver lining to the fact to the fact that they are, you know cannot be diversified away because uh, the, of these well defined factor risk the factor returns are not going to be arbitrage away so this is different from riskless arbitrage right for for traders when we are chasing after alpha that's what people call riskless arbitrage profit uh, returns are alpha if you trace after offer, offer typically will go away after some years when everybody has discovered that arbitrage opportunity. You cannot sit still. You cannot sit on your laurels because everybody are looking for these resource arbitrage and they will go away sooner or later. But factor returns are different because these are not arbitrage opportunities. These are these returns come with well defined risk and a lot of investors or traders don't like those risks. Because they don't like those risks you will be able to generate that return year after year. It is factor returns are here for the long term, or at least may not last forever, but at least would last much longer than riskless arbitrage profit because not many people, even if they know there's profit opportunity, not many people want to engage in this particular trading strategy or investment strategy because they don't like the risk. They don't like this long drawdown by holding value stocks. Uh, and uh, you know they don't like the uh, uh, drawdown by holding momentum stocks uh, and shorting uh, stock that have just gone down recently. So all of these reasons is why factor model are actually attractive because of this risk. Now, so, as I said, it's not necessarily the case that uh, these uh, factor return will remain there forever. Although it's going to last much longer than to, uh, than arbitrage returns. Uh, when the risk diminish, for example, in recent years, uh, the risk of um, holding small stock have diminished. Perhaps because people feel that you know they can invest in small stock, more small stocks using ETF instead of just buying individual small stock, uh, small cap stock, they can just buy an ETF of small cap stocks, uh, like a Russell 2000 ETF or something. Uh, if that's the case, people are you know are going to uh, reduce the risk of 
owning small cap stocks. They view the risk of owning small cap stocks are less. So if you're trading the SMB factor, uh, where uh, you're, you're sh you know, buying small cap stock and, and shorting large cap stock, well, because people perceive the risk of owning small cap stock has diminished, this SMB return has also diminished. So yes, the factor can go away, but it goes away usually because the risk has diminished, or at least the perception of risk has diminished. If there's still, if the risk is uh, alive and, and, and healthy, uh, you can enjoy the factor return forever uh, in, in theory. Okay, so now, uh, now that we know, you know what, the, what the rationale for trading factor model is, uh, how do we compute them? Uh, now, there are, as I said, you, there are two kinds of factors, cross-sectional factors, which depend on each stock, and time series factor, which depend on the time, but not on the stock. Uh, to compute a time series factor is, uh, such as an HML, it's pretty easy. Uh, you know, they are observable. You, 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 you know, the HML portfolio is a portfolio of um, high uh, book to market ratio stock, you know, the value stock minus uh, growth stock. And so, you know, if, as long as you know this portfolio, you constructed this, this um, uh, uh, head, what, what people call head portfolio, uh, you will know what the return is. So that's observable, you don't have to compute it. But the factor uh, loadings, that is the, uh, the regression coefficient of your particular stock's return uh, as a linear function of these factors, that's of course unknown. So you have to run a regression fit for this every day, for this future, for this, uh, your stock's return against the prevailing HML factor, uh, but that's easy. So, you know, you, you, you just enter, you, you just get a long enough time series and you can run this regression day after day using a certain Okay, so, um, however, it is actually slightly difficult to find out what the uh, the factors are for cross-sectional factors. Now, in a cross-sectional factor, it is, uh, by by convention, the factor loadings are the observable quantities, such as the fundamental factor loadings, uh, you know, dividend yield, book to market ratio, and so forth. These uh, these are known for each stock, or you, you might call it, you know, you might be interested in technical factors. They are also observable and known. But the factor itself is again the the regression coefficient. But the problem if in uh, using regression to compute the factor in this case, this this, um, this cross-sectional factor in this case, is that you know naively you can just take one snapshot in time uh, and oops, get rid of this. Uh, and um, if you pick one snapshot in time, uh, what you can do is that uh, you collect the future return of all the stocks in your universe, and then uh, you can uh, regress that against the uh, you know their their factor loadings, such as their dividend yield and so forth. Uh, if you do that, so you know I illustrate here, you have a vector which is the dependent variable vector, which consists of the future return of every stock in your universe, Apple, Google, Microsoft, and so forth. And then the independent variable vector uh, would be the, um, you know, the particular factor you're interested in. Interested. Maybe it's earnings, maybe it's different than you for each stock. And uh, you can just uh, regress them, you know, see how, what, what's the linear relationship between the earnings and the future return is. And that will result in, in this case, for example, the earnings factor. Uh, and of course, you can use multiple factors to uh, run multiple regression on it. Uh, you know, one might be earnings, the other might be different yield, and so forth. So you will have a multi-factor model in this case, and all uh, all these different factors will be combined appropriately using the appropriate um, uh, regression coefficient. But there's a problem in doing that. It is because uh, the if you do it one day at a time, every day you might get a very different regression coefficient and the fit will not likely to be very good uh, because even though you might have 500 stocks, uh, you know, the fit you know, is not as good as if you have thousands of uh, data points, so you only have maybe five, you know, if you're 
de dealing with a factor model for S&P 500 universe, you will have only 500 data points per day for your for your fitting. Uh, but the main problem is that day to day you might get a huge fa variation in the regression coefficient or in the, in the factor. That's not very satisfactory. So oftentimes when you are computing cross-sectional factor, you want to aggregate this data uh, over many days and uh, before you run the regression. So in, in, in effect, you have fixed the regression coefficient uh, or in this case, uh, the factor to be uh, pretty much constant over a certain period of time or at least you make it change very slowly. Okay, so that's just a technical issue uh, when you are computing cross-sectional factor when you're doing this linear regression. Okay, but actually there are, you know, if you don't like linear regression, actually there are simpler ways to utilize factor models. Uh, one simple way uh, is that instead of uh, regressing all these factors together, we treat all the factors as independent, you know, earnings, dividend yield, and so forth. Uh, we treat them as independent factors uh, and we can standardize them into just a score, right, uh, using uh, their mean and the standard deviations. In other words, you find the C-score, the standard score of today's earnings uh, relative to the past distribution of earnings of that particular stock, right? You standardize them. You find the past mean of the earnings, you find the past standard deviation of the mean, and then you can uh, find what, uh, what the C-score of that, uh, of, of your earning is at today. Or, um, instead of doing that, you standardize them across, cross-sectionally. So, you look for the mean of the earnings in the S&P 500 universe and you find the standard deviation of the mean of the earnings and then you find where your stock stand within that the mean and standard deviation. So that's a cross-sectional C-score of the, of, of the earnings factor for that particular stock. And then after you do that, you would just add them with the appropriate sign. So let's say in a hypothetical example, the uh, ROE of the stock in the S&P 500 index, let's say it has a mean of 0.6, and a standard deviation of 0.4. Uh, book to market ratio has a mean of 0.1 and a standard deviation of 0.5 and so forth. So you have, um, you know, and then finally we have Microsoft is in that S&P 500 index and it has a particular ROE of 0.3 and a bill, uh, book to market ratio of 0.2. Then the total factor for, uh, you know, factor score for this uh, Microsoft would be, you know, a, uh, ROE factor is 0.3 minus the mean divided by standard deviation and then plus the um, BOM factor is 0.2 minus the mean of 0.1 divided by 0.5 and it comes out to be minus um, 0.55. So that would be a kind of a factor score for MSFT without doing any mean regression. Okay, so, so that's just, uh, and then also we are combined them with the correct sign because that plus is is in place because we believe uh, that the uh, stock that has a higher ROE and stock that has a higher book to market ratio will have a higher return. That's the assumption. If you think that stock that has a higher book to market ratio will have a worse return, then you have a negative sign instead of the minus plus sign. So this is a sort of um, simplistic way of computing factor models because you don't need to know exactly what the regression coefficient is. You are computing each factor individually, uh, independently, just add them up with the correct sign. And oftentimes that will work um, just as well as if you are using linear regression. At least, uh, you know, it reduces certain uh, overfitting. Now, even this standardization may not be necessary. Sometimes all you need to do is uh, to rank the stock and add the rank of these stocks to get the top, so summary rank. You don't need to know the exact value of the ROE uh, you know, uh, as uh, the, the, the ROE of Microsoft relative to the uh, S&P 500 ROE. You don't even need to know that. All you need to know is that you want to rank the ROE of all the stocks in uh, in in S and P 500, and you know if the stock has the highest ROE, it might have a, uh, a um, rank of 500. If the, the stock has a very low ROE, then it will have a rank of one, and then you just add this rank together. 
So that you can you get rid of even the standardization procedure. That's an even simpler way. And then finally, there is a, uh, a also a very common way to construct factor models is that again without using any linear regression, which is that you are just sorting the portfolio with respect to each factor at a time. So let's say you have uh, a number of factors, three factors, and you think that the most important factor is ROE. Then you sort the portfolio with respect to ROE and pick, let's say, the top quintile, the, the one that the stock that has the best ROE in the top fifth of the portfolio, consider that the long portfolio, and then pick the bottom quintile of stocks with the lowest ROE, treat that as the short portfolio. And then within each of these long and short portfolio, you pick another factor, this time might be dividend yield. And then you will resort them, and then again in the long portfolio you pick, let's say the um, the top quintile of in terms of dividend yield, and in the bottom uh, portfolio, uh, the short portfolio, you again sort it by dividend yield and pick the bottom quintile of stocks that has uh, the um, lowest dividend yield, and then so on. You can you can probably have enough stocks to sort by three factors, and then therefore. Uh, in the long portfolio, you will have stocks that has the highest uh, ROE, the highest dividend yield, and the highest whatever um, third factor you pick. And in the short portfolio, you have stock that has the lowest ROE, the lowest dividend yield, and the lowest whatever third factor you pick. And hopefully, uh, that that long short portfolio will um, be another way to uh, the factor returns of these three uh, three factors without again having to run linear regression and subjecting yourself to the possibility of overfitting bias and it's very simple and it is actually a very common way uh, for people to utilize factors in in uh, in a long short portfolio right And um, so, as you can see, I have progressed, you know, in the method of utilizing factors, I progressed from complicated to simple. We started with linear regression or multiple linear regression with multiple factors, and then we progressed to just ranking the stocks and adding, uh, I'm sorry, to, to the C-score, the standardized uh, factor score of the stocks, to uh, just ranking the stocks, and then finally to a multi-sort uh, simple uh, algorithm. And so going from complicated to simple um, might not seem the best way for a human civilization to advance, but actually it oftentimes works in many practical arenas. So the Nobel Prize economist, uh, the Nobel economist Daniel Kahneman, who invented the view of uh, behavioral finance and behavioral economics, um, mentioned that this kind of uh, ranking method uh, actually outperform many regression-based methods in not just in finance, but in many areas of social science. And I have found that to be the case myself in a lot of my bad hands. Okay. Okay, so now let's uh, go put aside some of, some of these uh, methodolog methodological uh, issues and look at some of the interesting factors that uh, you know, many finance uh, textbook didn't mention. You know, the ones that I've talked about are dividend yield, ROE, and the HML, and SMB, and so forth. Those are well known. You can find it in any textbook. But these following ones are the ones that people, uh, you know, have actively come up with in, you know, under, undergoing active research in recent years. And a lot of them has to do with um, uh, options uh, and volatility. So the first one, uh, people call it the variance risk premium is simply the difference between the implied and historical volatility. And it turns out that the higher the implied vol, uh, the more negative the return. The higher the VRP, the variance risk premium, the lower the, the return in the future. So options traders clearly know something. They bid up the implied volatility because they know that the stock is likely to tank or the, the market is going to tank. So it is a, a predictive variable for future return in that case. The second one is, you know, the, well, the implied volatility is, uh, in some sense, the um, the second moment of uh, uh, return distribution. Uh, but we can also consider the third moment, which is the skewness or skew. And the implied skew is uh, a uh, the options. Uh, 
counterpart of historical skewness. It is computed by taking the difference between out of the money call and the out of money put option prices. And it turns out that the higher the in price skew, the better the P to return. That's also very reasonable uh, because uh, you know again if you believe in options trader, the option trader bidding up the call and uh, you know relative to put option and that created skew. Um, now uh, that you know so if you so the, the the reason that the option traders do that is because they expect positive return and it turns out that they are oftentimes right. Okay, so and the kurtosis we can you know proceed along this line. We might as well study the fourth moment of returns, and that's kurtosis. And again, the counterpart in the uh, in the options world would be implied kurtosis. So the implied kurtosis is just the difference um, between the sum of the out of the money call and put and the at the money call and put. So if you have um, high implied kurtosis, it means that the out of the money options are more expensive, and Paradoxically, it also predict positive returns. Uh, it's not intuitive. I can't explain it very easily, but it turns out that if options traders value the out of money put and call more, that is, 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 it portends a better return of the stock. Okay. So, and then the, the other non option based um, factors uh, are, for example, short interest. Now, the question about short interest is, do you think that um, a high short interest predicts a positive return or a low short interest predicts positive return? Well, unfortunately, both is the answer. It depends exactly on how you measure short interest. There are two ways, in fact, to measure short interest. One is um, well, short interest itself is is usually you know is is more precise. It's called short interest ratio. The short interest ratio is defined as the number of shortest shares as a percentage of the total shares outstanding of a particular stock. If you use the short interest ratio as a measure of short interest, then the higher short interest ratio, uh, you get higher expected return. So in this case, uh, what that means is that op the the short um, the short sellers are wrong because you know the more people short the stock, the more likely it's going to go up. So the short sellers are wrong. On the other hand, if you measure short interest using a, a number called days to cover (DTC), that is days to cover is how many days of trading volume is needed to cover the short uh, the total number of shorter shares. Right, so that is days to cover. If you use DTC as a measure of short interest, then high DTC implies a low expected return. So it's the opposite. In this case, the short sellers are correct. Right? The more people are shorting it, the more shares are shorted, the lower the return. So is, off, is short seller correct or short sellers wrong? It depends on exactly how you measure short interest. And also, not only that, it often depends on exactly what universe you're measuring. Are you doing it for the large cap universe, or are you doing it for short, small cap universe? Oftentimes, the market cap of the universe, the, you know, will change the sign of these factor loadings, and that is a common theme. You might say that, oh, um, in pi kurtosis is good, uh, you know, it's uh, high in pi kurtosis positive return. Oftentimes, you have to ask, does that apply to large cap or small cap stock? Does that apply to growth stock or to um, value stock. Many of these factors are not independent of each other. That's the key that we have to remember. Uh, you know, the in pi kurtosis, the sign of the uh, factor loading of in pi kurtosis would be affected by whether the stock has, is a scroll stock or various stock, whether it's a large cap stock or small cap stock. So that's a very uh, subtle point that one has to remember. You cannot really treat all these factors completely independently. It does depend on other variables. So that's actually a, um, a sort of a, a rejoiner to my earlier say, saying that you can use a simple model and forget about linear regression because linear regression will take care of this kind of correlation between factors. Linear regression uh, or in particular, 
uh, multiple linear regression does not differ, uh, does not assume independence of this factor. So in that case, if your factors are in fact correlated, have some dependence, you do need to use linear regression to sort the, to sort their dependency out. So that's a little bit of an aside, but let's go back to our laundry list of uh, exotic factors for stock. Uh, liquidity, certainly, you know, in terms of trading volume, low liquidity of a, on a stock predicts positive return. Okay, and then finally, uh, the, you know, nowadays a lot of people are using new sentiment as a factor. So, um, use, you know, you can buy it for multiple uh, vendors, Assern, Ravenpack, even Thomson Reuters, uh, maybe even Bloomberg sell these kind of uh, sentiment data, and you can use the sentiment data obviously to rank stocks uh, as well, or incorporate that into some regression model as well. Okay, so, um, so what are the nuances of uh, factor models? I have mentioned it already. Uh, you know, the fact that you have multiple factors, they can have interference. It's like taking multiple drugs together. The drugs have interactions. You cannot assume that taking one drug uh, alone is good and taking another drug alone is good, and then you take two drugs together, it's even better. That doesn't work that way. They may have negative interaction. So the two factors, you know, when you are treating them in a factor model, so oftentimes you cannot treat them as separately, uh, independently. Um, and in, partic in a particular way where they don't work very well is that some factors do not work on some industry group, some factor doesn't work on large cap and some factor doesn't work on small cap. Some factor doesn't work on growth stocks, some factor doesn't work on fair stocks. So it's for you to discover really uh, what kind of factor is appropriate for the particular uh, basket of stocks that you're interested in. So you might want to be very careful in just looking at research that is applicable to let's say five, 3,000 stocks and applying it to your particular basket because it might not work in the same way. But the sign of the regression coefficient might change depending on the characteristics of your basket. So that's quite an important nuance. But anyway, I think I have speaking, uh, spoken enough uh, of factor models as a very quick highlight of uh, what this is about. Um, as Dan said, I do teach workshops. So my next workshop is uh, artificial intelligence for traders in July 16 and 23rd. Those are Saturdays. Feel free to visit my website. Uh, for details, and you have, if you have any further questions, please feel free to um, uh, contact me on my blog in particular, or follow me on uh, Twitter. Thank you very much, and I'm certainly happy to answer any uh, questions.